Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start with a trip announcement. The Secretary General will begin a series of visits starting next week in the Pacific Islands and East Asia. First, he will go to Samoa from the 21st to the 23rd of August, where he will meet with Prime Minister Fiamme Naomi Mata'afa. His visit will focus on the impacts of climate change in the country. He will then briefly touch down in Auckland, New Zealand, on the 23rd and 24th of August, where he will meet with Prime Minister Christopher Luxon. From there, he will go to Tonga from the 24th to the 27th of August, where he will participate in the Pacific Islands Forum. He is expected to meet with the Prime Minister of Tonga, Mr. Siosi of Ofakiva Hofalau Sovaleni, as well as other leaders attending the forum. The Secretary General will also undertake various site visits to see the impacts of the 2022 tsunami and raise awareness of the importance of climate action measures, including early warning systems, adaptation, and mitigation. His visit will also serve as an opportunity to emphasize the impact of sea level rise in the region and beyond. In both Pacific countries, the Secretary General will engage with local communities and civil society representatives, including young people. The Secretary General will then go to Timor-Leste from the 28th to 31st of August, where he will take part in the commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the popular consultation in the country, which was organized by the United Nations. He is expected to meet with Prime Minister Kerala Shanana Guzmao and President José Ramos Horta and other senior officials. Mr. Guterres will then head to Singapore on the 1st and 2nd of September, where he will meet with President Tharman Shanmugaratnam and Prime Minister Wong Lawrence. And from the 2nd to the 5th of September, he will be in China. Among other engagements, he will take part in the 2024 Summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in Beijing where he will highlight the importance of South-South cooperation to build solidarity and drive progress on shared development goals. While in the capital, he will also meet with senior government officials. Thank you. And we also have further travel to announce. This evening, the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, will travel to Cairo, Egypt, to attend the 43rd World Scout Conference as keynote speaker at the invitation of the World Organization of the Scout Movement. While there, she will meet with senior government officials and other stakeholders and visit projects aiming to enhance climate change adaptation in the North Coast region and Nile Delta. On Tuesday, the 20th of August, the Deputy Secretary General will travel to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia to participate in the World Women's Forum at the invitation of the government of Mongolia. While in Mongolia, she will meet with senior government officials, nomadic communities, and other stakeholders. And you just heard from the Secretary General about the need for a pause in the fighting in Gaza to allow for polio vaccinations to be administered. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem today, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, Tor Venisland, urged all parties to prioritize the protection of civilians, conclude a deal for a ceasefire and the release of hostages in Gaza, and implement its provisions without delay or condition in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2735. He said that he was encouraged by the perseverance of the leaders of the United States, Egypt, and Qatar as mediators, and their call on both sides to conclude the ceasefire and hostages release deal. An end to this nightmare is long overdue, he said. Turning to Gaza, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reports that a new evacuation order this morning, issued by the Israeli military, has further shrunk the Israeli-designated humanitarian area to 11% of, of Gaza. Six blocks are affected by a, the new evacuation order in Deir el-Bala and Khan Yunis, including two within the Israeli-designated humanitarian area in Al-Mawasi in western Khan Yunis. More than 120 displacement sites are affected, housing an estimated 170,000 people. The new order also affects humanitarian facilities, including a World Food Program warehouse, while there's already a major shortage of storage capacity in Gaza, which affects our ability to receive and dispatch assistance. Many of the displaced concerned by today's evacuation orders had just recently arrived in the area after having followed precedent uh, preceding uh, evacuation orders. OCHA did dispatch a small team on the ground, and they all saw already thousands of people on the move many of them children and women. 
They were moving towards Deir el Bala without clear destination. Once again, they had to leave in a hurry with nowhere to go, being surrounded by death and destruction. Just for the month of August, the Israeli military have issued eight evacuation orders, affecting tens of thousands of people in Khan Yunus and, to a lesser extent, in northern Gaza. Combined, the ongoing shortage of shelter supplies, including tents and hygiene supplies, such as jerry cans and shampoo, and limited access to basic services at arrival sites, are exacerbating conditions facing displaced families, rendering them increasingly vulnerable as they struggle to meet their most basic needs. Turning to Lebanon, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says that ongoing hostilities and daily exchanges of fire across the southern border continue to affect civilians on both sides of the border. Our humanitarian colleagues say that in Lebanon, 110,000 people have been displaced since October, 35% of them children. And it's estimated that almost 150,000 people remain within the 10-kilometer blue line. Since October last year, 16 attacks on health care have been reported. 21 paramedics have been killed during hostilities, according to the World Health Organization. Severe damage to water, electricity, telecoms infrastructure, and roads in southern Lebanon have been recorded. 23% of the population is now food insecure, up from 19% in March 2024. We, along with our partners, continue to scale up relief efforts in support of the government-led response. But additional funding is urgently needed. Humanitarian partners need $110 million for ongoing response for conflict-affected people until the end of the year. Before the escalation of hostilities in October 2023, an estimated 3.7 million people were already in need of humanitarian assistance. The 2024 Lebanon Response Plan is only 25% funded, with $670 million of the total $2.72 billion required. We urge all parties to respect their obligations under international humanitarian law and stress that civilians and civilian infrastructure must be protected at all times. We also want to let you know that the Deputy Special Coordinator, Resident Coordinator, and Humanitarian Coordinator for Lebanon, Imran Riza, will brief at the noon briefing next Tuesday, the 20th of August. In Ukraine, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs said attacks in the Donetsk, Kharkiv, Kherson, and Sumy regions continue to impact civilians. The strikes damaged homes, schools, and energy infrastructures and impacted a government-led distribution, uh, aid distribution point. People continue to leave frontline areas as hostilities continue. Complementing the efforts of local authorities and first responders, aid organizations provided emergency humanitarian assistance in frontline communities and to those displaced in the Donetsk and Sumy regions and elsewhere. The UN and partners registered 1,800 evacuees for multi-purpose cash assistance in Sumi alone since the 6th of August. In July, more than $3 million in multi-purpose cash assistance was dispersed to over 10,000 people in Donetsk and Sumi regions. Turning to Sudan, the humanitarian coordinator there, Clementine Nkweta Salami, today welcomed the decision by Sudanese authorities to reopen the Adre crossing from Chad to Darfur. The Adre crossing is a critical humanitarian route for the delivery of hum emergency assistance to millions of people, including food, nutrition supplies, medicine, and shelter. The crossing point has been closed since February, and humanitarian partners have been using the Tyne border crossing into North Darfur, still from Chad, but the ongoing rainy season has made this route largely impassable. Ms. Nkwita Salami said that we have been relentlessly advocating for the reopening of the Adre crossing, as it, is, as it is the most effective and shortest route to deliver humanitarian assistance to Sa Sudan at the scale and speed required, especially to Darfur. Food insecurity in Sudan has reached record levels with nearly 26 million people in acute hunger. As you will recall, on the 1st of August, famine conditions were confirmed in Zamzam displacement camp near El Fasher in North Darfur. Food security experts warn that, civ that civilians in a further 13 localities in other parts of Sudan are at risk of famine. More than seven months into the year, the $2.7 billion Sudan humanitarian appeal for 2024 is just 37% funded, with $1 billion received. Turning to South Sudan, where our peacekeeping mission there has facilitated the country's first ever full virtual court hearing at the mission's base in Malakal, Upper Nile. The UN mission in South Sudan has been supporting the deployment of mobile courts to remote areas to help overcome obstacles facing South Sudan's judicial system. 
These include a lack of infrastructure, judicial officers, and mobility, which can create long delays in delivering justice and accountability. The hearing involving an allegation of murder took place in the presence of witnesses, unmisrepresentatives, and others, while the high court judge presided over the trial through a live connection from Juba. UNMA says it is a landmark judgment because it saved time and resources and was conducted in accordance with the laws of the land. In Nigeria, the UN Refugee Agency is drawing attention to the plight of 3.7 million forcibly displaced people and the need to accelerate sustainable solutions for them. During a visit to the country, Ralph Mazu, UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Operations, and Ruven Menekdewela, Assistant High Commissioner for Protection, pledged to increase the self-reliance of forcibly displaced people by supporting the government, helping displaced communities get back to work, ensuring they have access to government services, including social safety net programs, setting up financial instruments to encourage investments in communities at risk, and more. UNHCR is already working with the government to help displaced communities farm thousands of hectares of land, develop irrigation systems, Tackle food insecurity, t tackle food security, and increase rural employment. And you can find more online. And last, you asked me about a UN mission going to Bangladesh yesterday, and I can say the following. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, and the country's interim leader, Mohammed Yunus, mm -hmm. discussed a comprehensive range of support that the UN Human Rights Office could provide to the interim government and the transition, including on accountability issues. A team will visit Dhaka from next week, to discuss areas of support and the modalities for an investigation of human rights violations in the context of the recent violence and unrest. The High Commissioner is very committed to supporting the interim government and people of Bangladesh in a successful transition that strengthens the protection of human rights. Uh, any questions for me? Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you very much, Farhan. Um, the Secretary General just said that um, the best thing for a polio vaccine campaign would be a ceasefire and otherwise agreement of the parties will be needed for a polio vaccination campaign. Can, what is the Secretary General's reaction to the latest ceasefire talks in Doha. And I would assume before this announcement that the United Nations has made contact with the Israelis and with um, officials from Hamas and the other combatants about a possible polio pause. Uh, yes, and uh, on the latter part of what you were saying, uh, the World Health Organization has been in the lead. They have been in contact, as has the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and UNRWA, and they have been uh, trying to make sure that there can be some sort of campaign. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, said earlier today that they believe that uh, they can try to have a campaign going that will be in two phases starting possibly uh, as soon as late August uh, or, al or alternately in September. So that is what, uh, that is, what is being organized. Uh, and of course, you've heard what the Secretary General himself had to say uh, when he spoke to you at the stakeout. Uh, regarding the overall uh, peace efforts, we encourage uh, the efforts uh, by the United States, Egypt and Qatar, uh, to, to mediate, uh, and we are urging the parties to go the extra mile and finally agree uh, to a ceasefire and the release of hostages. Uh, you heard what uh, Tor Venisland said, which uh, I read at the top of this briefing, and that's where we stand. Uh, Deji. Yes, Farhan. Uh, just one follow-up with Edie's question. I'm just wondering, since Secretary General gave the, his statement on the polio campaign, does that mean that somehow there's principal agreement with the Israeli officials or, or Hamas or relative parties that the UN can do this. UN has already get the green light, given the fact that the evacuation orders repeatedly happened in Gaza. How can you assure that, that late August or September you can do this campaign? At this stage, we can't confirm any agreement. What we can say 
is that polio, as the Secretary General told you, does not wait. We cannot wait longer for a vaccination campaign because at some point people will start being crippled or dying from polio. So that is why it's urgent that, uh, that uh, we get progress on this. The Secretary General made clear to you at the stakeout that we will need agreement from the parties on this. Uh, we are working with them on that, but, uh, but it is clear that it has to happen very soon because otherwise the disease will spread. It's already been detected in wastewater. We don't want it to become too late. But no matter what happened, this campaign will go on. We are, we are pushing to make sure that a campaign goes on. Obviously, we need the conditions for it to go on. We need to have the vaccines brought in. We need to have cold chain equipment so that, so that uh, polio vaccines don't simply uh, overheat. We need to have the professionals uh, be able to go in. And most importantly, we need there to be sufficient peace so that people can, can get vaccinated. Which means we still need the pause. Exactly. That, that's Sounds what like a loop. Th this is what the Secretary General told you. Okay. Uh, and, and to quote, it is impossible to conduct a polio vaccination campaign with war raging all over. And that is the central point of, of what he's saying. Uh, Gabriel. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, has the Secretary General been briefed by Tor Wenisland about the uh, talks in Doha, or does he have any meetings planned for it to be debriefed on the talks? He, he, he's constantly in touch with Mr. Venisland and with, uh, and with his other envoys in the region. And uh, within the last hour, U.S. President Joe Biden said uh, that the, they're closer than we've ever been, much, much closer than we were three days ago. Those were his words in relation to the ceasefire talks. The Secretary General's reaction to that. It is always good to get closer to peace, but ultimately being close is not enough. At some point we have to get there, and that is what we are encouraging. Uh, Deshi? Okay, uh, one more question. On the, the peace talk in Doha, it's not, there's still no, no deal yet. We know that a, a Iranian officials some of them threatened that if there's no result of this peace talk, Iran might retaliate what they called, what Israel, Israel did in Tehran. Um, any response from the Secretary General on the uh, possible, let's say, um, escalation in the region? I don't, I don't want to speculate on what may happen next, but what I do want to point out is that we have repeatedly warned against a further escalation, which would be catastrophic for the region and for all of the people in it. Many, many countries, they tried to, to have their diplomacy on this issue. For example, French and uh, British foreign minister, they were in Jerusalem to talk about, the, to push the deal happen. But what the foreign minister of Israel, um, Mr. Katz, told people is quite worrying. He said, and I quote, if Iran attacks, Israel expects the international coalition led by the US Britain and France to join Israel, not only in defense, but also in attacking significant targets in Iran. What Ag do you feel of this? Again, as, as I just said, for us, the priority is to avoid any escalation, which would be catastrophic for all of the countries. Uh, Murad. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, can you please uh, clarify more on the uh, time frame of this uh, polio vaccination campaign? And how many, day, how many days exactly you want for these uh, uh, humanitarian poses? The time frame will need to be worked out with the parties. The World Health Organization is in the lead on this. Uh, I would just refer you to uh, the press release that they put online earlier today, which does talk about a, a two-phase uh, two uh, vaccination campaign that would ho hopefully begin possibly by uh, later in August or in September. mentioned seven days, but the seven days like for the two rounds or for I, I, four I, rounds? I wouldn't go beyond what, uh, what uh, WHO just, uh, just said. The, that is what they've put out and that's what we will stand with. All right, have a good weekend everyone. And uh, before you, you start that, here's Monica.